and good evening listeners and welcome to another wonderful night of Chia Youth Analogist Power. Tonight we're going to be talking about first aid for mental health more than a band-aid. If you're interested in our conversation please give us a call at 810-239-5733. Again the number is 239-5733. Al. No. The mic up a little bit oh my mic a little bit closer? Yes both of them. Wow. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? I, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? All right. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. All righty. Al, mm -hmm. what do you think about our topic tonight? Oh, man, that's right up Paul. That's right up Paul's alley right we there. Know what? We oh. might have Paul to have a seat at the table, but Paul, oh. you can't take over the, com the conversation. No, I'm going to take over the conversation. You're talking about folks got issues. I got issues. Well, you know what? We're talking about doctor documented issues. And your point is well, what? Well, well, the reason why I say Paul got some issues, right? Okay. The, the the little scooter that he got. Oh yeah. He has a smart. He has a smart animal, right? Now I don't know how smart that animal is that, to ride that, on that, the scooter. That are, yes, that's just what I'm saying. And it, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you know last week I said, well, shouldn't you have a helmet on the dog? He said, no, it's not required. But do you know he ordered him a helmet? <laughs> See, and that's what, what I'm saying. This is a good topic for him. But it's a paper <laughs> helmet. I mean, why would you even order a paper helmet? What is a paper helmet going to do? So you might as well put a costume on, on him, too. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh, wow. You know, I do not deserve, let me just say it right now, I do not deserve this type of uh, treatment. I have a wonderful animal and a wonderful vehicle. I get 83 miles to the gallon. I'm taking away from the o not taking away from the ozone layer. I'm doing good. Thank, thank you very much. He rides it in the rain. He rides it. Thank God, not in the snow. But it was raining last week, and he was he waited for the rains to side. He just took on off. Unbelievable. You got a nice haircut tonight too. I like it too. You look younger. I went to the barber college. Oh, did you? Girl, I got a shave and a haircut and a facial. Oh, my. For nine ninety nine. Oh, my. Who are you trying to look good did for? Did they do your feet? No, they wouldn't touch them. Oh, no. <laughs> they said there Don't were laws. They said there was laws. <laughs> All right, let's get into our All conversations right tonight. Right. I want to welcome back tonight Mr. Dexter Clark. <laughs> Mr. Dexter Clark is with the Genesee Health System. So welcome back again. I'm glad to be back. It's a pleasure. Okay, let's talk, start, start about, talk about our conversation. And I want to reintroduce the uh, term mental health. Exactly what is mental health? Well, well basically, basically mental, mental health or, or mental, mental illness, illness if you look, look at that, that uh, okay. deals, deals with, with any type any of condition, condition that affects, affects someone's uh, thought process, their feeling, feeling mood, their mood, where it makes, where it, it, makes hard it hard for them to, them to you know, you function or live you know, okay. you know, from day to day. And is, and is this something that has to be diagnosed by a doctor or can you self-diagnose yourself as having a mental illness? No, it needs to be diagnosed by a doctor or a mental health professional because a lot of times some of those symptoms that you may be having may be due to medical issues. Okay. You know, they mimic, you know, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. of a mental illness. I know in our last conversation you talked about how <coughs> mental illness can be uh, treated and it can be, um, what's the word I want to use? You can have it in control. You right. can be in control of it if you take your medication like you're supposed to and if you get counseling. Is there a reason why we have so many individuals who are not taking their prescription medication like they're supposed to? I think it's just like someone that has a medical condition, maybe somebody that has diabetes mm -hmm. and, you know, they don't like to take the insulin or, you know, they ha have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they don't like the side effects or there's a denial that they really have a problem or an issue. Uh. So, I mean, that goes the same for, you know, mental illness. Mm -hmm. And even more so with mental illness, there's a stigma to mental illness and okay. people don't want to admit that they have a mental illness mm -hmm. or want others to know because there is that stigma. Okay, that. to go with it. When we're talking about therapy, what type of therapy is available for those who do have these issues? Well, it just depends. There's cognitive uh, behavior therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also dialectical DBT therapy. There's various ones, and it depends on the illness, okay. uh, the diagnosis okay. uh, that you're dealing with. Now, today I received an email from my program officer with the Ruth Mott Foundation. And in Detroit on the 21st, if I believe uh, is correct, 
I like these new microphones. I can hear myself speak. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, June 21st, they're going to have a workshop to work with uh, post-incarcerated individuals. And one of the things they had on there as a topic was mental illness. Um, at our adult learning center, I do something as such as an intake. And one of the questions that I ask is, do you have a doctor documented illness or disability? I am running into a lot of my individuals who are bipolar and schizophrenic. schizophrenic. Is there some kind of correlation there as far as, I'm like thinking now, like a bug just went off in my head, but is there some type of correlation with the mental health issues and those who have been incarcerated? Well, uh, in a sense, sometimes when someone is not stable, not taking their medication, mm -hmm. they may do things, you know, say for instance, somebody that's delusional or schizophrenic, mm -hmm. may be thinking that the government's out to get them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they're breaking out windows to maybe let out, um, radio waves or something like that. So a lot of times they may be committing crimes mm -hmm. while, you know, psychiatrically unstable. Yeah. And, and that causes them to go in there now. The one good thing, they recognize that, you know, they cannot put someone from mental illness in the general population with other people because a lot of times that may do triggers, uh, you know, uh, with the other people. They may think, uh, get paranoid and those type of things. Mm -hmm. Also, we have, even in Genesee County, a mental health court that uh, for years before that, you know, people that committed crimes, whether they were mentally ill or not, went to jail. We found out that that was not the best thing because many times they committed the, the crime due to the mental illness and they need to be stabilized. Mm -hmm. So now we have a mental health court that, you know, helps them to get the treatment. And if they are successful, if they are about 15 months, if they go through the program with the compliant treatment and everything, they usually expunge their record of oh, that offense. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Is that just the one offense? Or if they have several offenses, would they be expunged or just the one? Well, it depends. I mean, when they go to mental health court, it's on whatever the charges are, you know, mm -hmm. the current charges. Those are the charges that are usually expunge. Are we having a growing number of individuals who need um, medical attention or therapy for the simple reason we're talking about the new mental health hospital or the uh organ the facility that they're fighting about is it going to be in carroll is it going to be brought back towards wayne and genesee county is there a growing need for such therapy and, and help for individuals yes i mean when we look at statistics one out of every five individuals in america has some type of mental illness or suffers from that now, one out of every 25 Americans mm -hmm. suffer from a chronic or a major me mental illness. So, I mean, yes, it, it is something that needs to be addressed. And I think it would be awesome, you know, to have, you know, the facility to treat the individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we only have the one that's up in Cairo, and it's mm -hmm. quite a distance away, you know, for mm -hmm. people within this area to have to go up there to see their family mm -hmm. members. Wow. Uh, so I think it's very, it's needed. Yes, definitely. Is mental illness a genetic thing, or is it brought on from drugs or something else? Well, all of the above. You know, it can be genetic. It can be environmental. Mm -hmm. It can be due from drugs. And a lot of people are predisposed. Uh, to that you know just like you know if you have a family history of cancer or high blood pressure a lot of times the genetic makeup mm -hmm. makes you predisposed to you know suffer from mm -hmm. that so like you say it can be genetic it can be you know through the family and we mm -hmm. do see that in some of the mental illnesses mm -hmm. but also it could be due to environmental you know PTSD you know mm -hmm. post-traumatic stress disorder mm -hmm. is due to the environment a lot of our soldiers mm -hmm. that have been traumatized that is true. come back and it's due to the environment that they've been in. Let me ask you something about that, and I don't know if you can elaborate on it. I know that we've had individuals that was in World War II, and some of them are still alive, and then some have passed away. My grandfather was in World War II. You didn't have so much of the, I'm speaking of my small box, some of the behaviors as we see now for those who went to Iraq and other wars, is there a difference in the war that brought on the PTSD? Or did the individuals who were in World War II in those wars, they probably had some of the behaviors of PTSD, but it was never diagnosed. Why are we having such a change in the behaviors of these individuals that went to war opposed to our post 
war veterans? Well, I, I think it's a, a several different things. One thing, I think there's always been some type of post-traumatic stress syndromes. I mean, my father that was in the Korean War, mm -hmm. you know, uh, would not talk about the war. And I know of other people, they just would not talk about those things there. That was their way of dealing with it. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it showed up in other ways. You know, there was still mm -hmm. the drinking and, and other, or the abusiveness, mm -hmm. you know. But now, because uh, we have studied and found out that, you know, there are a lot of different uh, symptoms that we can see now and triggers, I think uh, knowledge uh, is, has become, you know, more prevalent about we need to address these things. Okay. So I think it's always been there. Mm -hmm. But back then, in that time, you know, once again, there was a stigma. You know, you go over, you serve the country, you come back, and you man up, and you deal with it. You know, we learned that that was not always the best way that to deal with it. That is true. So now we need to be able to express and, and talk about what's mm -hmm. bothering and get the necessary treatment for that. You know, that makes me think about Al when we had mm -hmm. the um, the concussion from okay. the individuals who played football mm -hmm. and how the NFL knew about this but never spoke about it. And now we are experiencing more of the PTSD, the military, did they possibly know about this but they never spoke about mm -hmm. it. Um, and then we sit and we look at how they recruit people in order to go into the military. But then, you know, you think about, like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. you may not come back home mentally the same way as you left. Um, but that just made me think about it. You know, the government knows that this happens, but they don't talk about it. But they want you to constantly uh, be a part of the military. So, um, Al, mm -hmm. I read an article last week, I believe it was last week. And it's in some state, the, um, the prison is being sued. There was an individual who had a mental state and opposed to, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but the, um, the police officers, the sheriffs inside of the prison ended up killing the man because wow. they roughed him, roughed him up. And they sprayed so much pepper spray in his eyes and in his face. And I can't remember, he had so much trauma that he died. And I think it was because of the head, a lot of head trauma, mm -hmm. but he had a mental illness. And he had just got in trouble not too long ago because of the mental illness. Mm -hmm. And they were saying if the, um, the guards, if the guards would have looked into that, they would have known how to treat it, treat him uh, differently than if they would have treated someone who wasn't diagnosed. I know for years they have been talking about people with mental illnesses being incarcerated, that not necessarily should they be incarcerated, but maybe they should be in a mental institution. Um, tell me, do you know a little bit more about the mental I institution? What is really a mental institution? Well, well, basically, uh, the state, I mean, over the history, I mean, it has changed. It used to be that if you didn't care for anybody, you could get somebody put into the mental institution, you know, real easily. Uh, years and years ago, yeah. you know, family members that couldn't take care of their children mm -hmm. would have them go there because they know that they would get fed and things like mm -hmm. that, and they were brought up in that. Mm -hmm. But over the years, people, you know, have become, you know, very sensitive that, you know, we should not illegally incarcerate someone unless we're sure, mm -hmm. and, and when I say incarcerate, I should say hospitalized okay. an individual mm -hmm. against their will if they are a danger to themselves or others. So that is the criteria that we use mm -hmm. uh, for that. So somebody that goes to a state hospital or either a local hospital for psychiatric reasons, mm -hmm. it's because they are a danger to themselves or others. Now we have recently changed, we have what we call Kevin's Law, uh, that has changed now and it used to be only uh, a person that is an immediate danger to themselves or others would be taken to a hospital to be evaluated to see if they do need to be uh, hospitalized and voluntarily. Now are you saying Kevin? Kevin's, Kevin's Law. Kevin's Law, K-E-V-I-N? Yes. Law. Okay. That was a, and it was on the book years ago and basically what Kevin's Law states was that basically a person doesn't have to be at immediate danger to themselves or others at this time but they have the potential to yeah. cause risk of harm because a lot of times you would have to wait until they did something mm -hmm. to get a petition and mm -hmm. get a pickup order and have mm -hmm. them evaluated. Now, and we've just changed this within this past year, 
it's called an alternative outpatient treatment order where if a person has a history and a potential mm -hmm. to harm themselves, mm -hmm. uh, they can be evaluated or brought in to see if they need hospitalization or if they're not complying with their meds. Mm -hmm. You know, even though they're not uh, at risk at this point, but if they're not taking their meds and we know they have a history of this, then they can be brought before the judge mm -hmm. and the judge will, you know, say, look, you need to start taking your meds. If you don't start mm -hmm. taking it, there's a possibility you could be hospitalized. I know that there is several family members who have a problem with someone in that situation, whereas the individual not necessarily is a danger to other people, but they, are, they will harm themselves by not taking their medications and doing what they're supposed to do. So the family members are having a hard time with the courts in order to get power of attorney or either get the person into the hospital or get the treatment that they need. Is there a process in which a family can go through in order to get legal power of attorney of the individual to make sure that the person is taking their medication, but to have some kind of legal um, stance over the person so if anything goes wrong, that individual already have the paperwork in place in order to speak or be the advocate for that individual. Uh, there is a process. I think the most important thing is to get them into uh, a mental health service. First of all, they need to be uh, assessed to see what the needs are. Mm -hmm. And we ha we don't like to use, you know, uh, guardians or things as the first alternative. Okay. You know, you don't want to take away a person's rights if you don't have to, because if they're not doing well due to mental illness, mm -hmm. then if we can get them stable, they many times can lead a regular life as long as they're taking their meds and going to therapy or whatever is needed in their treatment. Mm -hmm. So uh, my suggestion would be to call like Genesee Health System, our access department, and mm -hmm. go through uh, a process of having them assess. You know, okay. that way we can see what would be the best fit. Because think about that individual. Mm -hmm. If you're going in and somebody says, okay, I'm going to take over your life and I'm going to tell you what to do, you wouldn't like that. that and you would true. be resistant to that. That is true. Even with mental illness, you still would be resistant to that. So you want to try to work with them. Now, if it gets to a place where they are at risk and danger, then you may have to go that next step. Okay. So if they decline to, to go, mm -hmm. is that when you go to the courts in order to try to get them into a, um, ins not institution, but try to get them assessed? Right. At okay. that point, uh, if they're resistant and they're doing things that's putting themselves at risk, mm -hmm. you know, if they're not eating, they're not, uh, you know, I mean, clothing themselves properly in the wintertime, you know, if they're living in abandoned houses mm -hmm. or if they're saying that people are out to get them and they have a knife and they're, you know, going to cut anybody that comes in there, then yes, at that point, then you want to get them assessed. Okay. to see, uh, you know, what needs to be done. And a lot of times after that assessment, it's, you know, to get them on some medication to deal with whatever that illness is. Mm -hmm. But if they refuse to take their medication, what can a person do then if the if they're individual that's been diagnosed refuses to take their medication, what can a family member do? Well, once again, like I said, prior to uh, this AOT, uh, what they would do is they would do a pickup order and a petition for alternative treatment order okay. where they would be taken in even against their will because they would be a danger to themselves or other. Mm -hmm. Now with this new AOT order, basically even if they are not immediate risk for themselves but they have a history and they're mm -hmm. not taking their meds, we can bring them before the judge and the judge will talk to them and they call it the black robe effect. But a lot of times when somebody comes before a judge, that will be maybe enough incentive for them to comply, mm, okay. you know. So, you know, uh, that's was, and that has been tested, you know, in other places that have used this. Mm -hmm. So that is the hope. But if not at that point, then they would go even against their will. The judge would order them to go into the hospital. Mm -hmm. That way they would have to take the medication. Mm -hmm. You know, they have no choice if there's an involuntary admission into the hospital. What would be the difference in going to Hurley Hospital? for psychiatric treatment opposed to going to a mental health place like in Carroll? What is the difference? Well, it's just the length of stay. Uh, usually the local hospitals, I mean, you're looking anywhere from maybe three to five days. If it's a long-term uh, hospitalization, if it looks like the consumer's not getting better, the patient's mm -hmm. not getting better, then they would go to the state hospital. 
but that's after you know the local hospital and the local uh, community mental health agency have tried mm -hmm. everything different meds and things of that nature but okay. usually when you go to Carroll State Hospital facility it's for a longer stay so is Hurley Hospital the only local hospital that works with those who have mental challenges no we have McLaren Hospital ah, as well they do mm -hmm. I was talking to someone uh, either today my brain is foggy either today or yesterday and they had to take a family member into McLaren Hospital mm -hmm. and they didn't have anyone on staff to assist them mm -hmm. and I'm like well maybe the only hospital you're supposed to go to is, is Hurley Hospital mm -hmm. wow McLaren Hospital yes. too hmm. let's look at our topic again first aid for mental health what would be the first aid for mental health well, uh, at Genesee Health System, we provide mental health first aid, and mm -hmm. it's free uh, to individuals in the community. You just have to go through our uh, customer service to register for that. But basically, just like regular Red Cross first aid, it teaches you basic uh, things to help an individual that's injured. Now, it's more than just putting a Band-Aid on them. You know, mm -hmm. like if somebody has a cut, you learn how to stop the bleeding, how to do a tourniquet if need be, or mm -hmm. how to do CPR. Well, with mental health first aid, you're basically basically learning the basic symptoms to know whether or not somebody is suffering from mental illness or is it something else? Mm -hmm. You know, is it like I said earlier, sometimes medical conditions, certain medical conditions or uh, reactions to medication can mimic, you know, uh, mental illnesses, mm -hmm. uh, symptoms and stuff. So basically this mental health first aid gives you the basics. It talks about the different types of mental illnesses, the symptoms, uh, when the onset is usually, and also how to interact with those individuals. Mm -hmm. I know I sent a staff member to one of the trainings from the last conversation we had, and um, he really enjoyed it. He really enjoyed it. He came back with so many certificates, you know, I was like, good <laughs> job, good job. Um, but a lot of, we always talk about the workplace and how much the, the workplace need training, but you never know who has a mental illness. So I recommend those who, churches, uh, community organizations, anyone to take the training, but however, you cannot discriminate and say, well, I'm taking it because this person, that person, that person. So what other organizations would benefit from this first aid training? Well, you kind of hit all of them. I mean, their churches, I mean, many workplaces, because everyone is dealing with a stressful environment. I mean, when we look at it, you know, you if you have kids, if you worry about your job, if you worry about your health. So we have to learn how to manage that stress, but also uh, have to be able to identify uh, whatever we're dealing with illnesses you know whether we're suffering from a mental illness or health issues mm -hmm. or we see other people and the whole idea is to try to get people to get help a lot of people are resistant to that but mm -hmm. if you don't know what you're looking at you don't know what to that direct to people so that that's why true. you have to be educated just like people now with cpr and stuff you know what to do if somebody has a heart mm -hmm. attack uh, you know about the aed and things mm -hmm. like that you know how to do the heimlich maneuver somebody's choking so mental health is the same thing we want people to get to the point where you know when you see something going on with somebody mm -hmm. psychiatrically that you will be able to assist to, to get them directed to the needed services they need. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something we need to learn. I had a question right on the tip of my tongue and it slipped that quick. Hmm, I don't know what it is. Paul, what do you think about this conversation? You know, I have a friend. I'm coming. Don't stay too long. <laughs> <laughs> that is just wrong <laughs> on all levels. I have a friend who has a, um, a son Mm -hmm. who has a history mm -hmm. and they would go to his house at seven o'clock and administer his meds every day mm -hmm. to make sure he got his meds and I didn't know that that was something that they offered I thought that was fabulous oh yes we do have a program that is open 24 7 uh, 365 days a week and they uh, go out and see people all times of night all weekends holidays wow. to administer the medication to make sure you know, that they stay stable and that they're doing okay. Well, actually, he's been in jail for the last 30 some odd days. And uh, he's kind of grateful because that gets him off the street drugs. Mm -hmm. And they're hoping when he gets uh, released, if he doesn't have to go back to the environment that he was in, which was, you know, the girl next door, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was motivating him to do the wrong thing, that things will get better for him. So we've got mm -hmm. our fingers crossed. Question. 
we know that when we have other medical issues, we do have insurance that doesn't pay for something. Is that long yeah. enough? Do I need to leave now? No, you can stay because I... my time is almost up. So, you. <laughs> so, a lot of people are having problems with paying their medical bills. Now, when we're talking about this situation, how much is that is covered up under health insurance? You know, if we have somebody that's going to give you your meds, we do know that if you. That's almost like private duty some, in, 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 when you have the certain police. illnesses. It's the police. They don't come. Up. I mean, it costs a lot of money. So you're getting me off. Yeah. It costs money, and a lot of times your insurance doesn't cover it. But for something like he states, does insurance cover that type of service? Yes. Uh, most of our consumers at Genesee Health System are on Medicaid. Uh, okay. And Medicaid covers, you know, all of those type of services. Um, mm. If they're not on Medicaid and they have uh, less insurance, then, you know, what we try to do, we do have a limited amount of general funds that we try to help those that need the help. But then at the same time, we're trying to get them on insurance that will help cover and pay for that. Wow. So, yeah. okay. Isn't that something? It is. Yeah. So we have... That's good um, stuff. That is true. That is true. Um, listeners... Um, the Center for Higher Educational Achievement is accepting enrollment for our Adult Education Center. If you're interested in finding out more information about our Adult Learning Center, please give us a call at 810-553-2140. It's like four cameras in my face, and I'm being pointed at. The furthest one. This one right here? That's one? Your camera, yeah. Oh, hey, Marce, how you doing? <laughs> so um, if you're interested in our programs and services, please give us a call at 810-553-2140. In addition to the Adult Learning um, Center, we also have uh, legal services for you. If you have any legal problems and you need to speak with an attorney, we have a partnership with Legal Services of Eastern Michigan. We would like for you to give us a call at 810-553-2140. It doesn't make any difference if you're a resident of Flint or of Genesee County. Please give us a call. Um, Genesee Health System. If someone needs to contact anyone, who would they contact and what is the contact number? Uh, they would call the Access Center, and that number is 810-257-3740. Okay, is the Access Center, like, information, or what is that department? Well, that department will screen them and direct them into the, you know, proper place that they need to go. Now, we also have a customer service, if you want to call them, and that's 810-257-3705. All righty. My question probably popped up in my head. Guess what they're opening on Pearson Road in Mount Morris? What? A chia. No. Um, I was going to say some kind of restaurant. Um, how about a dodgeball arena? No. The old Denny's is being renovated into a, a marijuana dispensary. dispensary. Oh, that makes sense. In addition to the old Bob Evans. Right. As well. Wow, that's that close together. On Pearson Road. Pearson what? In Mount Morris, on Pearson Road, in Mount Morris. You know where the old Myers used to be? Right next right. door to um, Red Lobster, the old Denny's. Oh, See, I thought you were telling me Denny's was about to open back up. Right, right. Well, Denny's, I didn't understand. Denny's had a lot of racial issues, and it's right. amazing. That was the 80s. Forgot. I don't forget. It's a 90s new generation. Too. 90s. The 90s, they had problems too. 90s. Blacks <laughs> always up in there. You know, I forgot about Starbucks real quick. Well, that's different. So anyways, all right, so let's look at marijuana. My time is running out. How, is there any studies that show that marijuana is linked to any type of mental illness? I don't know if there's any studies. And as an agency, we, you know, don't support that using it for treatment, although it can be used to help people with different, you know, types of treatment. But as an agency, we do not, you know, support or use that in our uh, therapy and our practices. But um, when you look at it, I mean, now the use of marijuana may lead to other uses of drugs and things like that because mm -hmm. you want to get that other high, which can also cause other illnesses. You know, years ago people used to use acid and things of that nature, and mm -hmm. a lot of times people's brains were messed up because of that, and they had a lot of the schi uh, schizophrenic and psychotic things. Mm -hmm. So even though... Al, uh, Al and I want to sign up for the study. Is, is there going to be a study? Yeah, be a study. You want to sign up? Yeah, we'll okay, yeah, we want to sign up and see if marijuana helps mental illness. Right. You yeah. don't want to be compensated financially. You just yes. want to smoke the marijuana. Well, yeah, we I do. Be compensated I want to be compensated financially. Yes. Do you all know we're on the Christian radio 
I know. What? It's a it's a it's a scientific it's study. A, yeah, it's a scientific this study. This is for the good of humanity. What are you right. talking about? Al was uh, not Al. Uh, <laughs> Paul was winking his eye. So if you ever see him, he needs prayer. <laughs> Invite him to your church too. You can't sit him on the front row. <laughs> I am trying to help science. That's all I'm saying. I'm trying to help science. Well, I am. We can find out that it's good for mental illness, and we can have everybody fixed. Alrighty. Um, anything else you want to say in closing? No, I think that's it. You think that's it? Yeah. I think we did a pretty good job. Al, you yes. got anything you want to say? I'm good. You I'm good? good? I'm good. Paul, you got anything you want to say? I better not. not no. You sure? <laughs> I'm already in trouble. I know I'm in trouble. Listeners. Al, I'm in trouble. Me too. You're in trouble? <laughs> Me too, Paul. Yeah. Well, listeners, I forgot to, Monday is the holiday. On camera. Oh, what's that great? Listeners, I forgot that Monday is the holiday, and I hope you enjoy your first holiday of the season. And join me next week at Chia Use of Knowledge is Power. Have a great work week. Thank you.